By the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, chemistry has come quite a long way. We have our scientific method. We have Dalton's atomic theory. We have our three fundamental laws of chemistry. We have knowledge of the periodic table and the way those different elements combine to form molecules, which most people are fairly convinced at this point that things like atoms and molecules exist. We, we even know about things like DNA to some degree. But unfortunately, the underpinnings of chemistry, which is the Newtonian theory of physics, has left us with a few holes to deal with. Um, one of the problems with our picture is that, for example, if we had an oven, the theory of electromagnetism predicts that we would have infinite energy produced inside of that oven. Uh, scientists like Michelson and Morley perform experiments which show there's no luminiferous either. That's what light is supposed to travel through. There's the photoelectric effect in which shining ultraviolet light at a metal causes it to produce a current and doesn't behave at all the way that it's expected to. There's the phenomenon of radioactivity where atoms decompose spontaneously. And later on in the 20th century, there develops the question of why don't atoms collapse once it's realized that there's a positive nucleus surrounded by negative electrons. Well, the solution to this is to develop an entirely new form of physics. And what we, we have to understand is that the reality on the small scales, submicroscopic, where molecules and atoms exist, is actually governed by entirely different rules. And we're going to call these rules quantum mechanics. So this is the difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. Classical mechanics is the old Newtonian theory which has existed up to this point. According to classical mechanics, we can treat everything as a particle, so like a, a billiard ball, something that has a definite position and has definite properties you can measure. If you look away and look back, it's going to have the same properties that it, it did, you know, as long as you look back quickly enough. So. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, is going to treat things as waves. And so waves are different. You know, the position of a wave is, is spread out. You can't pinpoint an ocean wave to one specific coordinate. And furthermore, waves can have multiple properties at the same time. Uh, for example, if you think of music, you can have a chord which has the properties of different notes all played simultaneously uh, to give you that sound. And so that's a, a property of, of waves. They can represent a superposition of states, whereas a particle just has one state. Well, classical mechanics, it's deterministic. If you know all the initial conditions of your system and the rules that govern it, you can predict exactly what's going to happen. For example, firing a cannonball, you can predict its exact trajectory. Turns out that the rules of quantum mechanics are only probabilistic. And so we're, we're capable of listing possible outcomes, but we don't know for absolute sure which of those outcomes is going to occur even if we have the maximum possible amount of information about the system. According to classical mechanics, our object could have you know, any amount of energy. It could be at any position, etc. But according to quantum mechanics, our object can only have very specific allowed energies and, and other specific allowed quantities. So clearly this is a very different picture than our classical picture. Well, this probably seems like a bit of a paradox. How can these completely different rules exist when our previous set of rules have been fairly well established at this point? They do a pretty good job in most cases of describing the phenomena we experience. Well, the answer is that on these larger scales, these very bizarre quantum features tend to average out. And so the, the features that remain that don't get averaged out, those are the ones that we experience every day. And those particular features can often be described using the classical picture. So this is what's called the correspondence principle. 
it says that for large energies or masses, so visible objects that we're familiar with in our day-to-day -day experience, quantum mechanics has to make the same predictions as classical mechanics because both of these theories have to be true um, within their proven domains. Because quantum theory expresses everything as a wave, we're going to want to develop a little bit of intuition for how waves behave. So what a wave is, a wave is an oscillation that travels through space. And another feature of a wave is that it carries energy. And the amount of energy that it carries is proportional to the number of oscillations per second, the number of these cycles that it goes through in a, a unit of time. And that's called the frequency. So for example, this would be a low energy wave if it only has one oscillation, say, say this represents one second of time. And if we have lots of oscillations over that same second, that's going to be a much higher energy wave. So that would be the difference between high energy ultraviolet light and low energy infrared light. Waves have some interesting properties in the way that they interact with each other. They can add together, that's called constructive interference. So if you imagine we have a jump rope here and someone tugs on it in this direction with some amount of force, it'll send a wave propagating through the, the jump rope. Well, imagine we have someone else do the same thing with different jump rope. Well, now imagine that they both pull on the same jump rope together. I think it's probably intuitive that we're going to get a very similarly shaped wave, except it's going to be twice the size because we have twice the force being applied. And that is exactly what we get. Another way we can think of it is if we add together the amplitudes of these two individual waves, then we'll get the total amplitude of this wave over here. And then, of course, where there's no amplitude, 0 plus 0 is 0, so we cross this line in the same position. And the negative amplitudes also add together. The waves can also subtract, which is called destructive interference. And so now imagine that um, one of these people pulling on our, our jump rope pulls in the up direction. That would give us this wave. Or maybe they pull in the downward direction. That would give us this wave. Well, what if these two people of, of equal strength, one pulls in the up direction, one pulls in the down direction at the same time? Our, our jump rope's not going to move. So we're not going to have any effect. Equivalently, we could also add this positive amplitude to this negative amplitude, and we would get zero. And the same thing for all these other points here. They would all cancel out to give us zero amplitude. Well, we can have any number of waves add together. We can have you know, hundreds or, or thousands of, of different waves with different shapes all adding together to give us our final result. And so that final result is called an interference pattern. And it can become fairly complex when we have lots of individual waves adding together. Another interesting phenomena is if we have two waves of equal amplitudes adding together, they can give the impression of a, a wave that's not moving. And so, for example, if you have a, a guitar string, you might notice when you pluck the guitar string, you, you get a picture kind of like this, where you see these, these high peaks and you see these nodes where the string doesn't seem to be moving very much. And what's happening is that there is a forward wave going through that string. And there's also a, a reverse wave going back the other direction when it, the wave bounces off the end of the tether. And we get constructive interference so that when those two moving waves add together, we get uh, these peaks here and everything in between. And then, of course, at our nodes where the value is always 0, that always adds up to zero. And so it will look like you have kind of this shape here. But, but of course, it's not a, such a fixed shape that you don't notice the string is moving. It's oscillating back and forth where the forward and reverse wave are adding together. Now in our quantum picture, absolutely everything you can think of is a wave. 
protons are wave, electrons are waves, atoms are wave, molecules are waves, you and I are waves. And the way that we're going to represent the wave of whatever we're examining is with capital Greek letter psi. And this is called the wave function, the mathematical wave function of whatever it is we're considering. So we can write down some complicated mathematical expression and when we evaluate it, that's going to tell us the shape of the wave. Something really interesting is that if we square these values, it's going to give us the probability of measuring those properties. So for example, if we know the wave function based on the position and time, then if we square it, we'll, we'll know the probability of measuring a particle at such and such position and such and such time. Now to kind of wrap your head around this, let's consider a classical example. You know, let's say we wanted to write down this psi squared function, this probability function for a flipped coin. Well, basically we're gonna map this on a scale of zero to 100%, but we'll, we'll just go ahead and do it as a fraction from zero to one. So about half the time, our, our flipped coin is going to wind up being heads, and about half the time it's gonna wind up being tails, and about you know, one in every 6,000 times it's gonna land on its edge. And while it's flipping in the air, we don't know which is which. All we can do is write down these probabilities. Well, what about after it lands? Let's say that it lands on tails. Well, at that point, obviously, there's no probability of it landing on heads, and there's no probability of it landing on the edge. It's just 100% probable that it lands on tails. This is called collapsing the wave function, giving it a definite value. Now, as a simple example, let's say that we want to depict the wave function of an electron. Well, put it in a one-dimensional box, by which I mean our electron can move left, it can move right, it can't move up or down or, or in or out. Well, at a low energy, our wave function might look something like this. Just kind of like a, a simple sine function. And if we square that, we'll get the probability of locating the electron at that particular position. And so if we square it, we're gonna get all positive values and where we have large negative numbers, we'll get large positive values. Where we have large positive values, we'll also get large positive values. And so we get a function that looks like this. So according to this, it's very likely that we will observe the electron in this region or this region. There's basically no probability at all that we would observe it here or that we would observe it here over at the edges. So that's something very interesting. That's definitely different from what we would expect based on in classical physics. Well, in general, our idea of position is really confounded once we start talking about quantum mechanics. It just doesn't behave at all like we expect it to. And the reason for that is because we're talking about waves. And if, for example, we have you know, this wave representing our electron in the box, well, let me ask you, where is the electron located? Is it located here? Is it located here or here or here or here? Waves don't really have locations. The wave is just simultaneously existing through the entire region of the box. And so that's kind of why our sense, our intuition about position breaks down. Well, if everything's a wave and waves don't have position, then why is it in our day-to-day -day experience we think that they do? We, we think that objects have position. Well, the answer is that when we measure something, i.e. we interact with it in some way, that's going to cause its wave to change shape. And when it changes shape, it goes from having its probability all spread out like this to having its probability localized in some position. So initially, there's you know, maybe a 25% chance of finding our electron here, or a 25% chance we find it here, or here, or here. And after we perform our measurement, our probability function changes, and now it's almost guaranteed we are going to find it, for example, maybe in this section right here. And there's very little probability of finding it somewhere else. So if we perform a second measurement, we'll see it here. And if we perform a third measurement, maybe we'll see it here again. And so we think the electron has a position, a position of right here. But maybe if we measured it a thousand times, 
occasionally we would measure it at one of these other locations. Well, every time we measure it, we, we localize its probability. So as long as we're very fast in measuring it, we're going to get the same wave function. Maybe it'll be even larger here. And so what that does, it kind of locks the electron in place. This is called the Zeno effect. It's a, a real effect. If you watch Doctor Who, they have those angels that if you look at them, they're frozen in stone. And as soon as you look away, then they can move around. And Doctor Who calls it quantum locking. But, but it's actually a, a real thing that if you persistently measure an electron or some other quantum object, that's going to fix its properties until you stop measuring it. Well, if we wait a short while and we don't perform that measurement for like, you know, a picosecond or something, then that's going to let our wave function start to relax and kind of expand back to its original form. There might, you know, for a short while still be a, a higher probability of finding it where we saw it last time. But if we wait a really long time, then it's going to go back to the way it was originally. And now there's an equal probability of finding the electron here or here or here or here and it's back to not having what we would think of as position. Let's broaden our question a little bit. Why in general do these large physical objects seem to follow different rules than these small quantum objects? Well, for these large objects or things with large energies, the waves that we get, they're kind of too small to see, too small to have a distinct effect. So say for example, we have a, a small moving particle placed in a box. We want to know, you know, where are we most likely to observe it if we peek in our side of the box at some random point. Well, according to the classical picture, we have an equal probability of, of finding that particle at any point in the box. If it's moving back and forth and we check in in some random time. Now, according to the quantum picture, as we saw, we square that wave function, we get you know, maybe a couple of peaks. And so we, we might find our electron here, we might find it here, we would never find it here, here, or here. Well, if we have a very high energy, then it's the same situation in the classical case, still equal probability of observing our, our billiard ball or whatever bouncing back and forth in any location. Our quantum picture now we have a much higher energy wave, so as, then we're going to get a lot more wavelengths here, much higher frequency, and you can see that this kind of looks like this. And in fact, if we keep increasing the energy, eventually we're not going to be able to distinguish between this case and this case, unless we zoom in really, really close. And so for large enough scales, the quantum picture is as far as we can tell, identical to the classical picture. But in truth, we always have a wave. It's just sometimes we can approximate it with a straight line.